So thank you very much. It's a delight to be here, and I really appreciate this initiative by Atomium Culture, um, and, and particularly this topic. So this topic that's looking at those three areas of science, media, and democracy. For me, that's very exciting, and so I, I try to keep my comments to, to three to five minutes, I think you said. So first of all, um, science. All of those three areas, science, media, and democracy, they're all changing hugely. And that's why it's so exciting, because everything, all the rules have changed. Everything is different. And if you think of, all, of science, first of all, science is no longer the domain of very smart people, very specialist in white coats who are quite separate from the rest of society. That's just no longer the case. Today, everybody's a scientist. So we all have access to data devices. Um, we go around gathering and transmitting data. We call these devices mobile phones. They produce huge amounts of data every minute and every second. And if you think of something else like um, remote sensing, that used to be the domain of space scientists or geographers. But now, remote sensing, uh, you just have to look at Google Maps and you are engaged in remote sensing. So uh, really, the world has changed hugely and we need to remember that. Science then is much more democratic in who can take part. But we need, this brings with it some real challenges. And the challenges are for me is differentiating between peer-reviewed science and, differentiate, and, and that includes science done by citizens and what you might call junk science because both are out there and it's quite hard to differentiate between the two. So if you are developing policies, it's important that you differentiate between those two. So um, second, the media. Um, the media is changed hugely, and that's partly because uh, advancement of free content, which is available on the internet, uh, has really challenged what we regard as classical journalism. And this doesn't just affect local or regional newspapers, but also the really big European media outlets, such as Liberation, or Frankfurter uh, Allgemeine. So what happens there is, because the content is free, then there is the possibility to reduce your staff. And if you reduce your staff, who goes first? And in many cases, I see that specialist journalists and the science journalists, they go first. So there is an issue with the media. We need to think about the digital economy, and we heard a bit about that, particularly from Vice President Cruz earlier. And we have now social media, which is very important. And it is interesting, last week, Science announced uh, uh, or published a table on top Twitterers or tweeters uh, who are scientists. And some scientists have over 100,000 people following them, and some over a million. And of the top 10, this is quite interesting, of the top 10 people on Twitter, top 10 scientists, five of those are European, with Richard Dawkins, Ben Goldacre, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, Hans Rosling, and... Brian Cox, how could I have forgotten him? Uh, I, actually, I've only got 8,500 followers. That might change after today's talk, but I don't know if I'm going to hit the 100,000 level. But social media is more and more important because you can get ideas out and being discussed. So science is changing. The media is changing. What about democracy? And and I'll finish with these comments, and for me, these are the most important. We generate knowledge by funding research. We have blue skies research, and we have applied research. 
and research is done by our universities, our institutions, our businesses and by others. So a very broad spectrum. We generate that knowledge and we must use it. We use it to have an impact and that will be an impact on people's lives. It might be through creating the prospects of uh, new jobs, growth, but importantly, it also provides us with the information or the evidence that we can use to provide really good government. It gives us the evidence on which we can base policy. But we need to remember that we can no longer, for me, we can no longer make policy as we used to in the 20th century because those days have simply gone. I've given you some examples of how much change there has been. You cannot exclude citizens from the evidence base. They must be part of it, and they must be part of the decision-making around uh, how we balance up risk and reward and how we use that evidence. So one of the things that I've been promoting within the European Commission, because we have a big opportunity with a new Commission, is to think about how do we gather evidence in a way that's completely transparent, and I've proposed that we could have an open evidence portal in the Commission where we put out a call for evidence that when evidence comes in, it's clear where that evidence is coming from, people who may have no vested interest or who may have substantial vested interest. And then governments, and including the Commission, should have an obligation to analyse that evidence again in a transparent way, to say why we accept or give more, more priority to this evidence rather than this. So the analysis should also be open. And then we take that analysis, which should be free from political input at that stage. And that's very important in my mind. So we should not bias what question we ask. We have to have an independent, open call for evidence analysis. And then it is up to policymakers to develop options on the basis of that evidence. So they can have options which then the democratically elected politicians make decisions upon. But what I would ask is that the politicians do not start discussing the evidence, what they would like from the evidence and what they don't like from the evidence. The politicians should accept the evidence base which is translated to them by advisers and others. And they should do what they are expert at, which is being politicians and making the political decisions on the basis of that evidence. Because we have a real problem if we start to try and unpick the evidence. For me, the, the goal, the prize is, if we do this properly, if we are transparent, understanding that transparency is sometimes very painful indeed, but if we are transparent, and actually we don't have a choice, we'll, we'll need to wake up to this sooner or later, that if we are transparent and we have a procedure of complete openness and then we make choices on the basis of politics, actually. So we say, yes, in this case, we use the evidence, and uh, this is our proposal, this is what uh, we suggest. That's fine. It is also okay in a democratic society to say, this is the evidence, we accept it, but for other reasons, ethical, economic, electoral, philosophical, we do something else. That's democracy and that's okay because science informs policy, it doesn't make policy. So I think if we can be a lot more open about that, then we have a trusted process and we need, and, and certainly at the beginning of this new commission, we have an enormous opportunity to, to see the rebuilding of trust in our European institutions because without that, uh, that goes, for me, the way of disaster. And then we have a very weak and a very fragmented Europe. So I think openness, transparency, 
and embracing that is the way forward. Thank you.